Today, I'll show you my process of building what I like to call the ultimate game and watch. If you're aware of the single game pocket LCDs that were popular in the 80s, right? Well, if not, you might at least be aware of several special editions that Nintendo have released in recent years. These, however, only focus on individual franchises. I thought it'd be cool to have a device that played a compilation of original Game & Watch releases instead, similar to various mini consoles that have been released, but instead based around a handheld form factor. As far as I can tell, this is not a project that's been done before. Please feel free to prove me wrong, however, it would be interesting to see how others have approached this idea. Plus, I don't actually own any original Game & Watches myself. They're expensive little blighters. All I have is this lame knockoff, so I'm hoping this project will introduce myself to the scores of Game & Watches that were released. This project began soon after the completion of my Vectrex Mini. Much like the premise of this Game & Watch, it was a working miniaturized version of the ever-lovable Vectrex released in 1982. This project went somewhat viral, at least as viral as I'll probably ever get. It was written about on a number of news websites including Gizmodo, and featured on a few choice podcasts I listen to every week, like the Retro Hour and This Week in Retro. It was bizarre to hear the hosts talking about me while I was doing the dishes, but a nice surprise nonetheless. It even featured in issue 118 of the Magpie. Retro Game On in print media? Madness. This video is linked in the description if that's something that might interest you. I learned a lot while making it and hope to transfer that knowledge into this handheld. So what were my main goals for this new project? Well obviously it had to look the part, a kickstand was compulsory, it had to comfortably play emulated Game & Watch releases and ideally be as small as possible. It would be my first foray into handheld and battery powered electronics. It would be based on the new at the time Raspberry Pi Zero 2W a super small and affordable computer that could crunch through this degree of emulation with ease. On that note, big yikes that I started this in April. I knew I drew it out and procrastinated, but 7 months is just taking the piss. Back to the Pi. I paid an exorbitant amount for mine because of poor availability thanks to the global part shortage, and of course, the C word. All I found in the stock was this kit full of other crap I didn't need, and even then I had to be quick about it. It took at least 2 stock cycles before I secured an order and it appears they're still difficult to find even as of making this video. This was a very standard installation of RetroPie which we will use for emulation. I'll skip over the specifics, but it's a free download and I used a program called Balina Etcher to write it to a micro SD card which is also a free program. I chose to connect my Pi to Wi-Fi once it was set up for obvious convenience reasons. Okay, I guess some of the accessories included in that kit were useful for testing. A downside of the small form factor is a lack of full size ports. The idea was to get as much working as possible through a monitor before worrying about aspects like the screen, sound circuitry and the battery. You may also recognise this little 8-bit do controller from the Vectrex mini video. It was perfect for testing purposes before I delved into the headache that would be the control system. But enough foreshadowing. While RetroPie is, for the most part, a key turn solution for retro game emulation on the platform, Game & Watch Simulation is an optional package and requires an extra step to get working. Navigate to the RetroPie Setup Wizard, Manage Packages, Manage Optional Packages, and scroll down the list until you reach LRGW. Choose the first option, install from pre-compiled binary, and reboot the Pi. The ROMs use the .mgw extension. Whole libraries of these games can be found online in this format. This is based on a much bigger project where the games have been recreated rather than ripped from the source. The original displays were segmented LCDs remember, so LRGW is considered a simulator rather than an emulator. Regardless of that, the process of transferring the ROMs is the same as usual. After the LRGW package is installed, the ROMs will live in a new folder on the Pi conveniently titled Game & Watch. Here is what the ROMs look like in action. Unfortunately, most don't allow you to go full screen, instead showing the entire original handheld. I immediately saw potential issues of displaying this on a 3.5 inch screen, but hey, that's a problem for future me. Speaking of the screen, a new package arrived. For this project, I decided to spend the big bucks on a real Waveshare branded screen rather than the cheapo clone I used in the Vectrex Mini. That suffered from awful viewing angles. The beauty of this screen is that it's designed to interface directly with a Raspberry Pi. Also on the delivery was the same amp and speaker I used in the Vectrex Mini, but more on the sound shenanigans later. Time for the first bout of manual labour. 
The Pi Zero is so small that it doesn't even include a pin header. But no worries, that kit came in handy again, since it included one that could be soldered on. Here's me doing exactly that. Riveting stuff I know. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell, and call your mother. She really wants to hear from you. A quick test afterwards will at least show the screen powering on, but we'll need to get a bit more involved to progress beyond that. To begin, we'll need to enable SSH on the Pi, so I can edit its innards via the command line. Handily, we'll be doing this over Wi-Fi using a client program on Windows called PuTTY. SSH can be enabled by choosing the Raspberry Pi configuration option, interface options, SSH, and yes to the prompt. Once you've done that, you can muck about in the command line. This isn't as scary as it sounds. You will need a basic knowledge of commands to navigate the text-only interface, which is a quick Google away, but for the most part, I followed a tutorial on Brackets Academy, which I'll link below. Instead of using the default drivers, which aren't brilliant for gaming, the tutorial instead details how to use an open source driver called this, which I don't feel like reading out loud. You may also remember this from the Vectrex Mini. This seems like the best solution for refresh rates on Waveshare and other such screens. The only gotcha is what's called a CMake command that will be specific to whatever you're doing. I crafted mine based on the specific screen I was using and also did away with the statistics that were displaying. This command is also in the description for anyone it may be useful to. Lastly, I disabled overscan in the config document to get rid of some black borders and there we go. Time for the money shot. However, finally playing around with the Game & Watch ROMs on the screen wasn't as great an experience as expected. The fact that most show the whole original handheld is distracting from what I'm trying to achieve and makes the gameplay window way too small. It was here that I found that the many Game & Watch collections that were released across the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance were perfect for this use case. I do understand this slightly derails the project's purpose, but it otherwise proved that this handheld would be an ideal way to play any console or handheld game, as long as they didn't feature more than four buttons and a directional pad. Basically, this handheld was becoming a third generation console or rounder that might resemble a Game & Watch. More on this later, however. Let's get the sound working. First, let's solder the speaker to the amp. Easy enough. Connecting the amp to the Pi though, not so straightforward. With the Vectrex, I was able to simply solder the amp directly to the audio output of the Raspberry Pi 2 I was using. It's not so easy on the Zero series of Pis, however, as it doesn't feature any dedicated audio output at all. Supposedly, there is analog output possible from the GPIO pins, but there's too much noise since the Zero doesn't include a low pass filter. Personally, hooking my amp to those two points proved fruitless. Not a sound at all. I guess the designers just assumed the HDMI output would be suitable for most projects. Thankfully, this is the internet and there's a solution for everything. Here's a tutorial I found for building your own low pass filter, courtesy of a blog called Shadow Forts. Find it linked in the description. So knowing I had to build an extra circuit, I wanted this handheld to be quite compact, although I guess that's less annoying than no sound at all. Regardless, the circuit is quite simple. The only change I made was that instead of the three and a half millimeter jack, the right and left channels go straight to the amp. Here are all the components needed, except for the electrolytic capacitors, which I had on hand. I never have the correct resistors I need, however, despite owning three drawers full of the buggers. Here's the circuit bread boarded out. It works well, but you'll also need to add an extra line of code in the config file to get it going. A massive breadboard doesn't quite meet the criteria of portability, however, so let's permanize it. To do that, I'll be building the circuit the old fashioned way on Vero board. I doubt no one except for old men who are into project boxes and ham radio knows what that is, so let me explain how it works. Instead of being connected by traces you'd find on modern circuit boards, ferro boards are laid out in copper connected grids with through holes for the components to be mounted on. The components can sit next to each other online if that's what the circuit calls for, but usually you'll need to cut the copper at key points and or add a few bodge wires. It's a bit of a puzzle to see how compact of a layout you can achieve really. Once I was convinced I had it all figured out, I broke it down to size by first scoring with a knife and a metal ruler before introducing my table's edge into its life. But the audio was much quieter than it was while laid out on the breadboard. After much head scratching, I realized I was using those bodge wires to connect the wrong things to ground. I'm not sure why I transposed that onto my little diagram from the source, but I was happy to figure it out nonetheless. With that, the sound portion of this project was ready to go. Let's delve into unknown territory, the battery. 
Since I had no idea what I was doing, I purchased this USB voltage and amps meter to try and suss out the power consumption of all the existing components. As expected, the draw was reasonably low, ranging from approximately 0.3 to 0.36 amps as emulation was running. With that in mind, I ordered a 3.7 volt LiPo battery with a capacity of 2400 milliamp hours. Theoretically, this should net me 6.5 hours of battery life if the draw I measured is correct, but that sounds ridiculously high. My math is probably wrong, and there are likely other factors like voltage conversion I'm not considering. Regardless, it will more than suffice for this project. Speaking of voltage conversion, we need that 3.7 volts jacked up to 5 volts because that's what all the existing innards run on. For that, I ordered this combined unit from a company called DF Robot. Not only will this boost the voltage to 5 volts, but it also acts as a battery charger, including a micro USB port for this purpose. Traditionally, separate units would be required, so it saves on space and wiring. Especially useful, since I wasn't anticipating the low pass audio filter when I began. Basic testing by running a USB cable to the Pi from the unit proved it was suitable, but I don't want a full size cable running around the unit internally, if possible. So, once I figured out the polarity from the inbuilt USB socket, it was trivial to instead send some wires to the relevant test pads on the Pi. To no surprise, it works fine. I then wired in an on off switch from my parts bin. This sits in line on the wire going to ground. Let's now remove that bulky USB port using my aging off brand desoldering pump. Yes, aging and off brand. We're off to a killer start too, immediately ripping out the power cable after waiting an age for it to heat up. Back to it, and it immediately splattered solder everywhere instead of sucking it up. After several more ill attempts, I gave up. This fire hazard is going in the bin. To be fair, and this is being very fair, it was successful on a few of the connections, but made a dog's breakfast of everything else. Instead, I had to suffer through using solder wick to get the job done. Ideally, this task should have only taken a few minutes with an operational pump. I won't subject you to that though. I managed to cleanly remove the socket sometime later. With that, the electronics were more or less complete. Except for the controller. Commentators of the Vectrex Mini seem to love the controller I built for it. I won't lie to you though, it kind of sucked in practice. Sure, it mostly looked the part, but it's not a great controller to use. The analog stick is fine since it was a pre-built part, but the buttons are too rigid. I deduced this was because I didn't use rubber pads. With that in mind, I decided to pilfer parts from this broken knockoff NES controller. Golden oldies around here might even remember it from a video way back when I still lived at my parents' house. The plan was to reuse the rubber pads, but also take design cues from how the buttons interface with the housing for a more comfortable gaming experience. To drive this, I will be using the Arduino Pro Micro again since game controller libraries are readily available online. First, we need to solder pin headers for prototyping and then upload the code. I'll leave a link for that down below. Busting out the breadboard again, I wired up as many switches as I thought I would need, tested it in Windows, and then, score! The Pi picks it up too. Good job, me. Know what I didn't do a good job of though? Condensing this script. I'm already up to page 5 and there is much more to discuss about this project. The controller electronics and case design go hand in hand from this point onwards, so I'm going to have to be a bit of a dog and make this project a two-parter. So, in the next episode...